now we are going to discuss another important topic which is esophageal diverticula now diverticula or diverticulum is defined as an outpouching of one or more layers of esophageal wall during swallowing the cricopharyngeal muscle fails to relax which causes increase in the intraluminal pressure this leads to an outpouching of the esophageal mucosa through the vacant area in the pharyngeal constrictors now types of esophageal diverticula according to the development they may be congenital they may be acquired congenital are mostly located at the upper end of the esophagus and also they are located at the bifurcation of the trachea so i repeat once again types of esophageal diverticula they are divided according to development congenital and acquired congenital are mostly located at the upper end of the esophagus and at tracheal bifurcation acquired there are three types one pulsion two traction three phrenic or epiphrenic according to location number one pharyngeosophageal midosophageal epiphrenic now according to the mechanism involved in the formation of diverticulum pulsion traction according to the presence of various layers true and false zenker or pulsion diverticulum well this is the most common type and it is also very important as far as your examination is concerned most common type as i already told you it is an acquired type it is a false diverticulum three times more commonly present in males it is usually present around or above 60 years of age due to lack of neuromuscular coordination it is seen in diabetics or seen in diabetes mellitus it originates from the posterior wall of esophagus in an area called kilian triangle or kilian dehiscence there are two types of fibers in the inferior constrictor muscle obliquely present are the thyropharyngeus transversely placed are cricopharyngeus kilian dehiscence is a potential triangular space located between the muscle fibers now when there is an esophageal obstruction due to chronic esophagitis or carcinoma there is increase in the esophageal intraluminal pressure mucosa and submucosa herniate through the weak point in the wall now you can see in this photograph there are thyropharyngeus muscle and their fibers are placed obliquely this is the posterior view and then change the color to make it more prominent they are placed obliquely whereas cricopharyngeus muscle the fibers are placed transversely you can easily appreciate it 
and there is a potential place or a triangle and this is the Killian dehiscence from where pharyngeal diverticulum, zancar or pulsion diverticulum comes out. This is the lateral view and you can appreciate it. This is the diverticulum coming out. Most common falls because it contains mucosa and submucosa. Okay. This is the barium solo and you can appreciate barium in the esophagus and there is barium in the diverticulum. Now what is the difference between this x-ray and the second x-ray? This is the first x-ray, this is the second x-ray. You can well appreciate whole of the barium has passed whereas it is retained in the diverticulum. Okay. It has a blind end so it contains the barium in it. Clinical features dysphagia that is difficulty in swallowing, regurgitation of undigested food, aspiration pneumonia. Why? Because if there is regurgitation of the undigested food, the patient may aspirate it resulting into the, in the pneumonia, then lung abscess, then halitosis because food sticks in the diverticulum for two to three days leading to halitosis which is bad breath, putrid breath or we also call it as fetal oris. Then gargling sounds in the neck. One feels sounds in the neck which are gargling sounds. About 25 percent have associated with gastroesophageal reflux disease. Diagnosis, barium swallow. I have shown you the photographs of various x-rays. Manometry, this shows lack of coordination between the pharynx and the cricopharyngeus muscle, hypertensive upper esophageal sphincter, hypotensive lower esophageal sphincter, peristalsis of esophagus are abnormal. Well, esophageal endoscopic examination should be avoided and uh, it may result in perforation of the diverticulum. Complications, obstruction, infection, perforation, hemorrhage and carcinoma. Repeat once again, it can cause obstruction it can cause infection due to the retained food, it can cause perforation, long standing cases and it could cause hemorrhage and carcinoma can develop in it. Okay, next diverticulum is traction type. It is present in the midpoint of esophagus close to the tracheal bifurcation. It results from contraction of fibrous bands which pulls or produce traction on the esophagus from outside. Causes are heel tuberculous lesion which leads to scarring in hilar lymph nodes or 
another important cause is silicosis it is a true diverticulum now i am coming back again to the difference between true and false true diverticulum contains all the three layers mucosa submucosa and muscular coat whereas false diverticulum contains mucosa and submucosa more commonly seen on the right side usually asymptomatic so repeating once again traction type present in the midpoint of the esophagus i underline it lies close to the tracheal bifurcation resulting from contraction of fibrous bands which pull the or produce traction on the esophagus from outside causes are heel to buccal lesion i am highlighting it and this leads to scarring in the hilar lymph nodes or silicosis true diverticulum because it contains all the three layers commonly seen on the right side usually asymptomatic and when they are asymptomatic and of small size no treatment is required this is the traction diverticulum which is seen in the midpoint of the esophagus again traction diverticulum seen in the midpoint of the esophagus okay epiphrenic means above the diaphragm well this diverticulum is above the diaphragm it is false type mostly false type mostly pulsion type usually associated with achalasia or hiatus hernia complications obstruction infection perforation hemorrhage risk factor for the development of carcinoma you know that if you notice that in complications or regarding the complications which are seen in diverticulum they are almost the same that is obstruction infection perforation hemorrhage risk factor for the development of carcinoma this is the diverticulum which is seen above the diaphragm or next topic is achalasia it is a rare disorder seen in 1 to 3 per 100000 it is a motility disorder age is between 25 to 60 years or even 70 years it is it is a motility disorder of the esophagus as i already told you definition very simple if you note the word a a stands for no or absent calasia relaxation absent relaxation failure to relax so we apply this term in definition 
it is a as i told you that it is a neuromuscular dysfunction incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter now i will uh, write lower esophageal sphincter les increase tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and absence of peristalsis in the esophagus which is responsible for the dilatation of the esophagus i just highlight this is responsible for the dilatation and clinically present as dysphagia so i repeat the definition it is a neuromuscular dysfunction in which there is incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter increased tone of the lower esophageal sphincter and absence of peristalsis in the esophagus leading to dilatation of esophagus and presenting as dysphagia okay etiology of the achalasia idiopathic when i say idiopathic the cause is not known or say primary achalasia it is due to total absence of total absence of nerve fibers and ganglia of orbash plexus that is myenteric plexus of esophagus and secondary achalasia which is due to chagas disease that is trypanosoma cruzi destruction of the myenteric plexus of esophagus is seen in poliomyelitis diabetes mellitus amyloidosis and sarcoidosis achalasia is also seen in neurodegenerative disorders then there is a term which is applied is pseudoachalasia the examiner may ask you achalasia or when you answer achalasia is bound to ask you pseudoachalasia pseudoachalasia results from inflammatory strictures malignancies of esophagus stomach or lymphoma now these are two photographs one shows normal and other shows achalasia in normal look at the esophagus look at the esophagus and normal esophageal sphincter that is lower esophageal sphincter and this is the stomach whereas in achalasia esophagus is dilated you can well appreciate and the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter is increased and this lower esophageal sphincter does not relax very important point tone is increased no relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter absence of peristalsis in the esophagus three important points for achalasia and again this is the stomach
In this disease, both excitatory, that is cholinergic, and inhibitory nitric oxide ganglionic neurons are involved. The inhibitory ganglionic neurons are responsible for the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter and also sequential peristalsis during the process of deglutition. Their loss leads to absent peristalsis in the esophagus and lower esophageal sphincter is not relaxed. It is now attributed to an autoimmune process to a latent infection of herpes simplex virus 1 and genetic susceptibility. Now let's move on to clinical features. Dysphagia both to liquids and solids. Sometimes it is more to liquids. Regurgitation of the undigested food that this food does not contain acid because it does not pass through the esophagus. Weight loss. Aspiration pneumonia. Of course, the food is present in the dilated esophagus and while lying down it can be aspirated and can result into the aspiration pneumonia, lung abscess, chest pain during the early course of achalasia due to esophageal spasm. I repeat all these dysphagia both to liquids and solids, sometimes more to liquids. Regurgitation of undigested food because the food has not passed to the stomach and does not contain acid. So there is subsequent weight loss. When this food is aspirated, it can lead to aspiration pneumonia. It can lead to lung abscess. It can produce chest pain during the early course of echalasia due to esophageal spasm. Now coming back to the pathophysiology, as I told you that the two type of ganglion cells or neurons, you can appreciate it here that these are the neuron or ganglion cells. Those produce nitric oxide, they are called inhibitory and they are responsible for the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter. Now they are lost as we know that they are lost. So there is selective loss. Whereas those produce acetylcholine, they are present. Ultimately, there is imbalance between the neurons which produce nitrous oxide and those produce acetylcholine. With the result, the tone of the lower esophageal sphincter is increased and it does not relax because the neurons which are responsible for the production of the nitrous oxide and VIPs, also called vasoactive 
intestinal peptides they are not being produced so the function or the secretion of the acetylcholine is unchecked now where these ganglion cells of the myenteric plexus are located suppose this is the lumen of the esophagus and they are located between the longitudinal and the circular muscle bundles okay and this is the in extrinsic nerve supply this is the myenteric plexus and this is the esophageal humor okay now the food is entering the food is, is entering in the esophagus peristalsis are disturbed remain stuck in the esophagus and esophagus is dilated esophagus is dilated and the lower esophageal sphincter is constricted and this is the stomach Now this is achalasia. I told you while discussing the subject that if you answer achalasia, you are bound to be asked by the examiner pseudo achalasia. Again, no peristalsis, food bolus, dilatation of uh, esophagus and stomach. As I told you, esophageal sphincter does not relax. Now I told you pseudo ecclesia is inflammatory in nature. Two to five percent achalasia are pseudo ecclesia and inflammatory strictures are there. Now these strictures they obstruct the lower esophageal sphincter. There is repeated inflammation and that leads to fibrosis and with the result the lower esophageal sphincter does not relax or does not open when the food bolus or food comes down. Right. Then I told you there are malignancies and this is carcinoma of the stomach, upper end of the carcinoma of the stomach, lower end carcinoma of the esophagus or the lymphoma. They produce constriction or pressure from outside with the result the lower esophageal sphincter or esophageal sphincter does not relax number one number two point is they send secondaries to the nerve fibers and destroy the ganglion cells one they are producing pressure due to the presence of mass from outside and other they are infiltrating the ganglion cells and destroying them and the mechanism of achalasia is produced but we call it as pseudo ecclesia because initially uh, the ganglion cells they are not destroyed but these malignancies like lymphoma carcinoma of the esophagus carcinoma of the stomach 
they pushed the ISO figures from outside or the sphincter from outside and later on uh, infiltrate the muscle fibers or myenteric plexus destroy the ganglion cell inflammatory structures as I told you sometimes if there is continuous reflux that can also cause inflammation of the epithelium of the esophagus because epithelium of the esophagus is very sensitive to the gastric contents of the stomach this is the stomach diagnosis manometry what manometry does it measures the peristalsis of course absence of peristalsis in the esophagus to incomplete relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter three increased pressure at the lower esophageal sphincter these are the findings on manometry barium swallow well as i going to show you the photograph of that dilated esophagus with poor emptying to air fluid level present and tapering at the lower esophageal sphincter giving it bird beak now this word rat tail you don't find in literature very frequently usually birds beak appearance birds beak appearance is the which you can appreciate on barium swallow of course there are epiphrenic diverticulum can occasionally be seen because i told you that epiphrenic diverticula they are associated with uh, hiatal hernia or they are seen in achalasia. Now endoscopic uh, examination does not have much value in the diagnosis but of course it has a value when we treat the patient with achalasia. Pathological changes, what do you find on pathology? What are the pathological findings? Number one, esophageal is dilated above the lower esophageal sphincter. Thickness of the wall is increased or it may remain normal. Myenteric ganglia, they are absent or reduced inflammation and ulceration of the mucosa above the lower esophageal sphincter complications secondary esophagitis of course food stuck there and there's going to be infection so ultimately there is secondary esophagitis Ulceration do occur leading to hematemesis that is vomiting out of blood and development of carcinoma of the esophagus in long standing cases. Treatment well, injection of the botulinum toxin is given at the lower esophageal sphincter because this counteract the action of acetylcholine and relaxes the lower esophageal sphincter 
but it has got its own merits and demerits. Repeated injections cause fibrosis, etc. But it's one of the treatment. Then pneumatic balloon dilatation. You put a balloon, you put an air in it and you dilate the lower esophageal sphincter. Why I am telling you this uh, uh, treatment part? Because we cannot uh, regenerate the uh, ganglion cells. That's why we have to relax the lower esophageal sphincter somehow or another by injecting uh, botulinum toxins or using pneumatic balloon dilatation or Heller's myotomy that you give a cut to the muscle and dilate the uh, lower esophageal sphincter but it has got again its own merit and dismerits and uh, the may and complication of reflux. Then nowadays another technique is used which is known as POIN that is per oral esophageal myotomy. So this is the treatment part but when we cannot give all these treatments uh, to a person then calcium channel blockers they are being used look at that this is what uh, i show you this is the barium swollen this is the esophagus look at how it is dilated and this is the constricted lower end that is lower esophageal sphincter. This is called birds beak appearance. Okay, or red tail appearance, which I told you is not much mentioned in uh, in the literature, but the term used is bird beaks appearance. Now, in long-standing or chronic cases, the esophagus shows diverticula. right so this is called sigmoid esophagus right so this is bird's beak appearance please don't confuse it with because i've written i and okay right let let me This is uh, bird beak appearance. Whereas this is the sigmoid. Peace of